Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we're going to get into a study, uh, this, another comment section. There's times where I want to put out Bible studies that I want to put out. There's times where God puts Bible studies on my heart and says, hey, this is what I want you to get out. And then there are times where brethren, whether they're lost people or false converts or actual brethren, are asking questions and God's like, you need to answer some of their questions. So we got another one, the comment section. What's the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity? I got to ask this recently because I'll make comments and videos. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll make comments about not adding to God's Word and not subtracting from God's Word. But before we get into the study, I'd like to start out with a hymn. Oh, how I love Jesus. And it's because He first loved me. You go ahead and look it up. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love you, Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love you, Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus because He first loved me. But this is Christ. I chose this hymn because it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Precious blood. Is it God's blood that was shed on the cross? Capital G God? God the Father's blood that was shed on the cross? Or is it a lowercase g God, the Son's blood that was shed on the cross? We're going to get into this. I know I might have lost some people in this video by making that because some people who want the truth, they'll listen. People who don't want the truth, they won't listen. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, I threw in that part, oh, how I love you, Lord, because it just seems repetitive. We're not supposed to be too repetitive. How I love Jesus three times in a row, I kind of threw it in there. Oh, how I love you, Lord, because Jesus is the Lord. No man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And when it means by the Lord, God Almighty. Almighty God. God the Father manifest in the flesh, which is going to help us get into this study. So it's a longer study than I wanted it to be. It was a simple question, and I could give a simple answer. And I'll try to give a simple answer, but I'm going to go into it because Bible believers, we want proof. We're Bereans. Just someone saying something doesn't mean anything if they can't back it up with the Scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I got a comment that said, and I'm going to read out the whole comment, and then we're going to break it down, and I'm going to answer and talk, and to key talking points and answer some questions. Starts by saying, hello, I need some help here. I am a saved KJBB, King James Bible believer. My question is, what is the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity? I know the word Trinity cannot be found in the Bible, and I always question that, but never got a real answer for the past 25 years. I went to an IFB church, I think that's IFB, uh, Fundamental, Independent, Fundamental, Baptist Church. It's a Babel building. I call them Babel buildings. All right. uh, traditions of men buildings. Buildings that line up more with Catholicism, with worldliness, organized religion, than it does with this right here. Are they two different concepts? Are they essentially the same but given different terms? Because I only see God hid in three areas, never the word Trinity. Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Then the sister in Christ. Okay. So, you have this. It's, there, she's asking basically Godhead Trinity. But let's break it down. First she says, hello, I need some help here. I'm a saved KJBB. I really want to push this because in order for this study to really resonate with people, it's going to resonate with people that are King James Bible believers. And today... Anybody could profess to be a King James Bible believer. I remember 33rd book, a brother in Christ, on one of his videos, he says he doesn't like calling himself a Christian because anybody can call themselves a Christian. The word Christian has been made a joke today. 
all these false religions that line up what I call <laughs> daughters of the whore, uh, Mystery Babylon in Revelation, uh, the Catholic Church, they're all closet Catholics, daughter of the whore, the Catholic Church, all of them are now starting to call themselves Christians. And I remember in the past, I uh, saw some videos and brethren were teaching and showing videos in the past where the Catholic Church, before the, before the ec if you don't, I don't want to get too much into extra stuff, but the ecumenical movement is we're going to try to bring all authorities back under Rome. We're going to infiltrate all religions. If we didn't create it, we're going to uh, infiltrate it. And we're going to make it line up with us. And we're going, to, we're going to start saying some of the same things. We're going to start putting in some of the false teachings. And we're all going to have the same false teachings. And we're all going to say the same things. And one of the things was as Christian. So before the ecumenical movement, Catholics were like, we're not Christians. Christians are those heretics that we burn at the stake. We're Catholics. We're not Christians. But then the ecumenical movement comes along. And now Catholic Christians, we're all Christians. Mormon Christians, we're all Christians. Um, Jehovah's Witness Christians, we're all Christians. We're all, the word Christian has become a joke and it's misused. People say, well, Christian just means you're following Christ. No, Christian in the Bible, we've done a study on this. Christian means in Christ. Christ, Christ in, Christian, in Christ. Those that are born again, saved, they're in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we did a study on this, on what does it mean to be in Christ? You know, made into us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. But I'm getting off, a little bit over on this, like off on a rabbit trail. But back to the point, the third, third book, he's like, uh, anybody can call themselves a Christian today. That's why he makes it a point to not just call himself a Christian, but he calls himself a Bible believer, a King James Bible believer. But here's the thing, today, that's been taken over also. Anybody can claim to be a King James Bible believer so I really want to go over this real quick. She says she's a King James Bible believer. What does it mean? And I believe her because she goes through and says, wait a second, that's not in the Word of God. What's going on here? Something ain't right. So I believe her. But I want to go over to for everyone who's watching, what does it mean to be a King James Bible believer? We're going to go through a lot, and I'm going to be turning to some places, but mostly we're going to be going through a lot. So pause the video and turn to the Scriptures. Get your King James Bibles out. This is what we believe in. All right? Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 4.2 we read, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandment of the Lord your God which I command you. What's the number one command today? Obey the gospel. I've come across people that says, Well, God, you make God out to be, uh, Jesus to be a commander and chief. No, he's our friend and everything. The Bible says there's no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friend. Jesus, God, the Father, showed great love for us when He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross. Okay. After that says, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you, did you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross? Are you taking up your cross daily? Remember, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You have to present your body a living sacrifice. We're supposed to keep the commandments of God still. People think that with the false gospels, we're not going to get into that topic, but the false gospels, they teach that you just get saved and do whatever you want. You're still your own boss. You're still your own commander-in-chief. You decide what's right and wrong. You decide what you're... No. Someone who truly gets saved and born again, this is the final authority when you're, and rightly divided. Predominantly the Pauline epistles for doctrine, for instruction and righteousness all throughout this book. You can learn from it. How to please God. Not to make the same mistakes other people made. How to live a holy life. Sanctification. How to have a right heart. But you see there, you're not supposed to add to this. Proverbs 36 says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And today, when we get into this subject, people are going to be saying that, you know, the Godhead, the Trinity, they're the same thing. I'm going to prove to you that they're liars. Anytime you see people trying to add to this book, the false gospel, faith alone, I've already proven faith alone, they're liars. It isn't faith alone. By grace are you saved through faith. You have grace and you have to go through faith to find that grace. There's two things there. Then Paul talks about in the book of Acts, which I think we're going to hit up here a little bit. In the book of Acts, I held nothing back from you, how it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's repentance and faith. There's two things. It's never alone. 
Anytime people add to this book, it's because they're trying to subtract what the book actually says. They've been proven to be liars with their false gospel, uh, for the Trinity, post to mid-trib. They've been proven liars because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. But you don't add to this book. A Bible believer says this book is perfect just the way it is. And when someone comes along and says something that isn't in this book, that's where we get to Acts 17.10. Acts 17.10 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They went to the synagogue to the Jews, of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. so. Paul comes around and says to the Jews, Hey, Jesus is your Messiah. He's the Christ. You crucified your king. And they're like, he had to use scripture. He had to go through the Old Testament scriptures. If you remember the story of Stephen, when he got stoned, he was going through the scriptures. Talking about Moses, how Moses was looking forward to Jesus' day. Abraham and everything. He went through the scriptures. And that's how we're supposed to be. A true Bible believer, when someone comes along and says, Thus saith the Lord, the Bible teaches, it's the word of God says. We check the scriptures. If it's not in there, you're a liar. You're a liar. Sister in Christ, someone's lied to you when they said Trinity. They lied, and I'll prove that. They lied. Uh, I mean, you had, another thing is you had Jesus rebuking the devil with Scripture. Okay. Matthew 4, uh, you can pause the video and read it. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. I'm trying to save some time here. But you have Jesus. He's out in the wilderness. He's being tempted by Satan. And Jesus says, it is written, and he quotes the Scriptures. As it is. He doesn't add to, he doesn't subtract from. And then you have Satan, he'll take part of Scripture and he'll add to Scripture. He'll take the part he likes or wants to use for his own benefit, for, to push his narrative, and when he doesn't like, he takes out and replaces it with his own words. Godhead. Man's words. Trinity. We're going to get into that. But you have Jesus saying, It is written. It is written. It is written. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's how we walk. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, he is, that he is God. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. We're going to get into this. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you come to this book, you've got to believe it's perfect. It's God's perfect written word. It's absolute truth exactly the way it is. And we've talked about videos of people professing to be Bible believers, and what's happening is, is that spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, that indoctrination of, yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be, Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can decide what, what you want God's word to say. I don't decide what this book says. I stand by what it actually says. I don't change it. Okay, there's times where I've been part of that indoctrination where there's times where brethren have caught me, not because I was trying to deceive people, but they said, hey, you said such and such. Where's that at in the Bible? And I'm like, oh, it's, it's there, it's there. And I go like this, and like, oh, wait, it's not there. I need to stop saying it. And that's, that's, that's what we're going to get with the Godhead versus Trinity. She's like, Godhead's in the Bible. Then say Godhead. Stop saying Trinity. These people who profess to be Bible believers. A Bible believer takes the Word of God and has faith in it, and it's perfect just the way it is. They don't. People think that if I'm not changing it, physically, like crossing things out or trying to put out another translation and, and, and mess with the text and physically, that it's still okay to mess with it verbally. People will read it as it is and they'll mess it up verbally when they go to talk about it. They'll start adding to and subtracting from the Word of God with their words, but they didn't touch it here. 
but they're still tearing it down with their words. It's still equally wrong. In fact, I think it's worse for people to claim to be Bible believers and be tearing it down with their words, adding to and subtracting from this book with their words, and still putting on a show. I'm a Bible believer. No, you're not. If you can't handle the book as it is, you're not a Bible believer. If you have to keep adding to and subtracting from the Word of God all the time, you're not a Bible believer. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Once you become a Bible believer, you're to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. We rightly divide what's actually in here. We don't add, we don't subtract. Okay, Rightly divide means, whole another study, being dispensational. What's written to us for today, the time of the Gentiles, okay, when salvation went out to the world, anybody can get saved. When Jesus was preaching the kingdom of the, uh, John the Baptist, then to Jesus Christ, was preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel, the salvation was only of the Jews. The time of the Gentile means that now salvation's gone out to the world, anybody can get saved. It's no longer salvations of the Jews and only the Jews. But you have to rightly divide what's for us and what's not. Adam and Eve. We don't have to worry about a tree. Eating. We don't have a tree of life, and we don't have the tree there, the knowledge of good and evil, and we're not commanded not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's not for us. It's called rightly dividing. But we have to study. When I first got saved, I believed Jesus Christ is God. Did I fully understand what we're going to go through, the Godhead? I found out more about God, about Jesus, and who He was in greater detail what, God meant that, what it meant to say that Jesus is God. As you study, James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and it breatheth not, and it shall be given to you. James is written to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, but this is instruction in righteousness. Throughout the whole Bible, this is true in every dispensation. Remember Solomon asking God for wisdom to judge his people, but you have to start out believing God's word. Today, you have to, it starts out believing this book. You know what led me to Christ? The real Jesus Christ? The Bible version issue. I know it kind of a long route thing, just, you know. But when she says, I'm a King James Bible believer, what does it mean today? Because that name, first Christian's been just taken and destroyed. Now, King James Bible believers have been taken and destroyed. There's people that claim to be King James Bible believers, but they tear up this book left and right with their words. They tear it down. A better rendering would be they use words that aren't in this book. And I'm gonna, I don't want to get ahead of myself because we're going to talk about that. Okay? They'll say, well, it's not a big deal. you know. That's not the talk of someone who's a Bible believer. That's the talk of someone who's a Bible corrupter. Who tries to justify adding to and subtracting from this, to this book in any way, shape, or form. It's not a Bible believer. Today we've got a lot of people professing to be Bible believers that aren't Bible believers. But this sister in Christ, the reason I believe, I don't know her, but I kind of believe she is, is because the first thing she notices is what? What they're trying to push isn't in here. Remember those Bereans? If, if, if Paul would have told them something that wasn't in the Scriptures, they would have kicked him to the side like he was nothing. And you know what they said after they checked the Scriptures and he lined up with the Scriptures? Verse 12 on Acts 17, I forgot to read verse 12. Therefore many of them believed. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. When people want the truth, we have it. When people don't want the truth, they, won't, they don't want what we have. God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Then she says, my question, I just want to get that out. A true Bible believer believes this book is perfect the way it is. We don't add to it, we don't subtract from it. Not even in our speeches and our preaching, we don't tear this book down by trying to say, well, a better rendering would be the original Hebrew and Greek garbage that you'll hear some preachers try to do as they profess to believe this book as if they believe it as it is, you don't need to go to the Hebrew or Greek. The only reason you go to Hebrew or Greek is if you don't trust this book as it is. That, and you're trying to act like you're intelligent and you're smarter than everybody else. Well, the I know the original Hebrew and Greek. No, you don't. There's no one alive today that knows the original Hebrew and Greek. Hebrew is a little different, but that's a whole other argument. Um, but the original Greek. Greek's a dead language. No one speaks it anymore. So she comes out and she says, My question is, what is the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity? Now, 
Acts 17.29. Pause the video and please turn to these three places. It's important. This is so important. Because we just talked about being a Bible believer. We believe this book as it is. So she's saying, what's the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity? That's the first question. Acts 17.29 says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's devices. There we see, think that the Godhead. Romans 1.20 And this sister does mention that it's mentioned three times in the Bible. We're going over them. Romans 1.20. We're going to go over them again. Just, just a quick going over 120, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There you have the word Godhead again. Colossians 2.9, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Capital G, we're going to get into that, but Godhead. So for starters, when she says, my question is, what's the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity? I always say this, the first difference, for starters, one is in the Word of God, the other isn't. Guess how many times capital T Trinity, which it's a title, it was created, that word was created to be a title for false gods, and we'll get into it. Guess how many times that appears in Scripture? Zero. I can look through the hole. Zero. So for starters, the biggest difference, and this should mean something to a Bible believer. Right now, this should get anybody who claims to be a Bible believer, who loves absolute truth, this is enough to get you interested to do the study even further. But this is enough to say, hey, something ain't right. And the sister in Christ, that's all it took for her to say, something ain't right. One is in the Bible, the other isn't. That's the first thing. Psalms 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Do you believe this is perfect? That this is God's word, and God said the way He wanted to say it. God said Godhead. The word Trinity is nowhere to be found. The first difference, one's in the Bible, one isn't. And to a Bible believer, that's important. To a real Bible believer. To Bible believers who have been indoctrinated with the yea hath God said, a better writing would be, and they love adding to and subtracting. You've been indoctrinated with all these words that get added to and subtracted from the Word of God. You'll say, that's not a big deal. That's because you're not a real Bible believer. A real Bible believer says, the Bible is perfect as it is. So when someone comes along and says, thus saith the Lord, the Word of God says, the Word teaches, we say chapter and verse. That's what a Bible believer does. And it always frustrates me with these people nowadays. Like I said, the Satan has infiltrated, and I believe there's some people that are saved that are struggling with being Bible believers because they've been so indoctrinated with all these terms, titles, false teachings, false adding to the Word of God and subtracting from the Word of God. They get truly saved and born again. God's working on them. And we've got to be patient. God's working on them getting ahead of myself again. And I, said, I said here, and this sister in Christ brings up the same point. I know the word Trinity cannot be found in the Bible, and I always question that, but never got a real answer for the past 25 plus years. Okay. I went to an IFB, into, in, I can't, but a Babel building, a Babel building, church. They, call, they keep saying it's church, but remember church is the people, it's a building. Back in the day, uh, it was a church that was in their house. That's why we call it a house church. It's a church. It's people meeting together in a home. You could have a meeting house, a prayer house. But it was never called a church house. Okay? It's a house church. There's a difference. It's a house where people, the church meets. Okay? This is what you get from the Babel... And I put down here, this is what you get from the Babeling system these days. Colossians 2.6 Colossians 2, 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. As ye received Him, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Part of the armor of God is you have to gird up your loins, study. You also have to have your sword, which is the Word of God. You have to keep it sharp. You have to keep reading it. But this is our foundation. This is how we learn to walk in the Lord. This is how we learn to be in Christ Jesus. 
This is how we learn to have that changed life after salvation. This is where we learn the true plan of salvation. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. It's in Peter. First or second Peter. Receive the... Or maybe I got it wrong. But please forgive me. <laughs> I'm trying to remember addresses. But receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe on the same name of the Son of God. It's only because there's a perfect written record that we're able to believe and get saved and born again and live a life of Christ and know where we're going when we die. And what does Satan do? He tries to take this away from you. He tries to take away the, the fact that there is a perfect written word of God today in English. So walk ye in him, rooted and built it up in him, and established in the faith. All right. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And this is how you do it. As ye have been taught, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. These battle buildings have been corrupted by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. They talk about church fathers. We always have done it. A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. It all depends on how you look at it and all kinds of other excuses. But the traditions of men, I could go into a whole study on this, but I remember that Jesus got onto the Pharisees and said, you have trumped the commandments of God by your traditions. Their traditions went against the Word of God. And they held to their traditions over the Word of God. That's all these Babel building systems. Every single one of them. They don't line up with this book anymore in any way, shape, or form. They line up with Catholicism. Building a building, calling it a church, that building a church, inviting both saved and lost to it, altar calls, pulpit, and so on and so on. Where's Paul doing it? It's not there. Notice what it said here. As you have been taught, Paul said, Be followers of me as I am of Christ. Today, in the time of the Gentiles, if you're following Christ, you're following Paul. He's the apostle appointed to the Gentiles by Jesus Christ. Paul said, Follow us as you have us for an example. Where was Paul doing anything that you see today in these Babel building systems? He wasn't. Why? Because they hold the traditions of men, rudiments of the world. The next verse, after the rudiments of the world, and what happens when they start becoming so worldly, and they start quoting philosophy, Trinity is a philosophy word, rapture is a philosophy word, and so on and so on. These are all philosophical words. What happens when they start doing things man's way, and saying things man's way, and they stray from this? And not after Christ. Not after Christ. For in Him, Christ, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's one of the times you hear the word Godhead. What happens? People come in with philosophy and start replacing things in the Bible like the word Godhead. And they go off traditions of men. We always have said it this way. We've always said Trinity. Now I've said it before, brother says Christ, I'll say it again. It was a trick of Satan. The early church, it was Godhead. It's written Godhead. Paul said Godhead three times. It's Godhead, Godhead, Godhead. And in the last probably 100 to 200 years, it was Godhead. It was always Godhead. You know who came out with the word Trinity? The Catholic Church around 400 AD. But the Christians rejected the Catholic Church. True Christians, Bible leaders, we stuck with Godhead. But here's how the trick goes. It starts out with Godhead. The Bible says Godhead. Then after a while, it's Bible says Godhead. Well, also, so also known as, sometimes used, Trinity. Sometimes people say Trinity. So it's Godhead, sometimes Trinity. Then a more time passes, and it goes, it's Godhead, also known as the Trinity. Then as time goes around, they switch it around. And they go, Trinity, also known as the Godhead. Then as more time goes on, it's Trinity, sometimes called the Godhead. And the next thing you know, by the time you get to the end, it's just Trinity. What'd they do? They got rid of the title for God. 
Most of the good Bible-believing, hardcore Bible-believing preachers, they say Trinity nine out of times more, like nine out of ten times. Sometimes ten out of ten times. They always say Trinity. They hardly, you hardly ever hear them say Godhead. What happened there? Traditions of men have come in and trumped the Word of God. You've made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. They've gone against the Word of God. Okay. 2 Timothy 3 7 says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know the best example of that is someone who can't handle this book as it is. They don't rightly divide or they can't and or they can't handle this book as it is. They're always trying to add to it, subtract from it, and, and this book over here that does the adding and subtracting, and that book over there, and this person says this that adds and subtracts. It's like they're ever learning, and they'll never come to the knowledge of the truth until you come to the point to being a true King James Bible believer. This is perfect the way it is. People keep jumping up and down. Faith alone, faith alone. Okay, chapter and verse on faith alone, where it says faith alone. Not where you think it's teaching faith alone, where it actually says faith alone. The Bible says we are saved by God's grace through faith. Paul says it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is never alone. Yet you have all these people, faith alone. Why can't you handle the Bible as it is? Because you're not a Bible believer. There's a difference between a brother being indoctrinated. We'll get into that. Some brethren, I believe, are saved, but they've been indoctrinated with the yea hath God said. Okay? But ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, people who don't believe this book is perfect just the way it is, they have no problem adding to it and subtracting from it. That's the Bible building system that she's probably a part of. It has to be 25 years and no one's told you the difference between... I'm not yelling at her, not yelling at you, sister in Christ, but no one's told you the difference between Godhead and Trinity? Uh, one of the wrong answers you will get is that, uh, that we use lots of words that aren't in the Bible. First you'll get told they're the same thing. Eh, they're the same thing. But if you, actually do a, if you actually study to show yourself approved, A, one's in the Bible, one isn't. And you actually look into it, they're not the same. You've been lied to. But one of the biggest things is they'll say more than anything is that, hey, well, there's lots of words that we use that aren't in the Bible. I'm going to go back to Acts 17.10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who come and thither went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things are so. A true Bible believer is still going to go chapter and verse. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. Why did so many believe? Because it is written. Remember Jesus Christ. It is written. It is written. Okay. Proverbs 36, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. They say we use lots of words that are in the Bible, and be careful of this, because they'll say Bible's not in the Bible. And I love doing this. <laughs> well, they're wrong. Bible is in the Bible. <laughs> right there. <laughs> the title page. The Bible. The Holy Bible. Okay. Bible is in the Bible. But that's to get you distracted, sister. Don't get distracted. Stay on the right course because you're on the right course. When we, It's not about you can't use words that aren't in the Bible. I use tons of words that aren't in the Bible. There's a computer right here. Show me where the word computer is in this book. Okay? I don't even think the word mug <laughs> is in the Bible. Okay? Car is not in the Bible. Plane isn't in the Bible. There's lots of words I use that aren't in the Bible. That's not the issue, and they know it. That's, I'm talking, it's getting to the point where I'm, either you're passing, you're ignorant, and you're passing on the talking point, or you're working for Satan. It's just that simple. Because they know that's not what we're talking about. We're saying when someone opens this book, and starts to preach out of this book, and starts to teach out of this book, and says, Thus saith the Lord, the Bible, the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures teach. The Word of God says... It better be in here. I never open this book and say, the Word of God says, Bible. Bible just means a library, a collection of books, because there's actually 66 books in this. It's not one book, it's 66 books in one volume. But when you sit there and say, thus saith the Lord, Trinity, thus saith the Lord, rapture, thus saith the Lord, faith alone, 
We go chapter and verse. Where's it at? So you're getting a little heated. I am, because that's the whole point. This sister in Christ, don't lose that. It's not in here, something ain't right. You're right, something isn't right. The Holy Spirit is saying, hey, the Bible says one thing, they're saying another. Something ain't right. You're on the right path, sister in Christ. You're on the right path. All right. So first, one is in here, the other is not, and it is a big deal. Okay? It's not that, hey, I'm just saying some word out here that I use in my day-to-day -day life, you know, um, versus saying, thus saith the Lord. But when you have someone teaching and saying, God says this, God is teaching us this, God's word wants us to live like, it better be in here. That's a Bible believer. Someone who says, oh, there's lots of words, words we use that aren't in the Bible. That's not a Bible believer. And I know great men of God that they started out as Bible believers. By the end of their ministry, 50 years later, they're not acting like Bible believers. They're acting like Bible correctors. They're tearing down this book with the wor their words. They've been indoctrinated over the years by the Bible building system with the yea hath God said. Spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. If you're after Christ, this is the final authority. And it's perfect just the way it is. Second, first, one's in here, one's not. Second, there is a capital G before Godhead. This is another big one. It's a capital G before Godhead, showing us that it is a title for God. Now, where do we get our name slash titles for God from? The world? Feelings and opinions? Well, I want this to be a title for God, therefore it has to be a title for God. No, that's chaos. We need a final authority. Only if we had a final authority. Oh yeah, I've been preaching and teaching. We do have a final authority. The Word of God. Where do we get our titles for God from? The Holy Scriptures. A good example of this. Okay. Let's see if I lost my, my place. Exodus 6 3. Exodus 6 3. God Himself is the one who gives us His titles and who He is. Exodus 6 3. Real quick. Why I'm thinking about it, the Bible talks about no man knoweth the spirit of man save, no man knoweth the man save the spirit of the man, and no man knoweth God save the spirit of God and those that He will reveal Himself to. I know I'm kind of butchering that verse a little bit, but God's the one who reveals Himself to us. He tells us who He is. Exodus 6.3 says, And I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. Almighty God, God Almighty. By my, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And you go to the Old Testament, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they called God Capital L Lord. They never said, actual said, God Almighty. They called him Capital L Lord. Capital L Lord doesn't mean master. Capital L Lord means more than a master. Capital L Lord means God Almighty. Almighty God. That's why Capital L Lord is always a reference to God. And then Jesus comes along and takes the title Lord. It's God manifest in the flesh. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's still God. He's Almighty God. But you see here, there's a title, Almighty God, God Almighty, name, I'm sorry, name, God Almighty that they know, because God revealed it to them, and then God revealed them another name, Jehovah. We get all our titles and names of God from the Holy Scriptures today. Once again, we say Bereans, we say chapter and verse. You know what's really being destroyed more than anything for the sister in Christ for this and for the brethren that are listening? Is they're trying to do away with chapter and verse. They really are. They're trying to mock chapter and verse, like the, the false gospels that are out there, the false teachings that are out there. We sit there and say chapter and verse, and they're like, oh, there they are, chapter and verse. Well, Bible's not in the Bible. Ha, 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 ha. And they're mocking us. They're mocking, but they're not mocking us. They're mocking God. They're mocking His Word. They're mocking being a Berean, saying chapter and verse. I would convert in a heartbeat. I have in certain areas. When I had a brother come to me saying, well, you just said there, where's that at in the Bible? Oh, doesn't the Bible actually say this? And we go all through the Bible, and there's times where I've had to take correction because I need to line up with this. Okay? Where do we get titles for God? 
and who God is here. Not the world, not philosophy, not vain deceit, not the traditions of men, not the rudiments of the world. Here, this is where we get absolute truth. Okay. There are two different names slash titles for two separate gods slash gods. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, we get all our titles and names of God from the Holy Scriptures. Then she asks, are, there two different, are they two different concepts, or are they essentially the same but given different terms? Because I only see Godhead in three areas, never the word Trinity. You're on to something, sister in Christ. Godhead's the only thing that's in here, not Trinity. There are two different names slash titles for two separate gods. That's what they are. They're two separate names. And there's times where they'll try to say Trinity's just a description. They'll try to take it down to a lower t, uh, lowercase t Trinity and say it's just a description of God. We still go chapter and verse where it says lowercase t Trinity is a description of God. But capital T Trinity was created by the world, by Satan, we're going to get into this, created by false, co by false religions, by philosophy, and it was created to be a capital T Trinity, a title for God's plural. And they tried to get it into here and say, well, you know, it, it's God, the, the ecumenical movement, of the Catholic Church. Godhead, Trinity, oh, it's the same thing. Bible buildings, you can have them and do, you can do everything our way. And you, still, you can still kind of be a Bible believer. No, you can't. You can't serve two masters. You either cling to the one, the Bible building system, traditions of men, the pagan trinity, or hold to the one, the truth. You'll hate one, despise the other, and you see that with a lot of people. People say, that's just talking about money. No, it uses money, mammon, as an example of trying to serve two masters. But you can't serve two masters. You can't serve the world and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't serve philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, uh, rudiments of the world. And it says if you do those, if you're serving those, you're not after Christ. You can't serve Christ. You can't serve God and two masters. Okay. There are two different titles. Exodus, 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, we read, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Plural. Second Samuel before me. Singular. Thou have no other gods. Plural. Before me. Singular. The Bible teaches time and time again there's only one God. Only one capital G God. Period. Then philosophy comes in and tries to tell you, well, it is technically one God. I'm getting ahead of myself. But 2 Samuel 22, 32 says, For who is capital G God, singular, save the Lord? And who is our rock, save our God? Lord, Almighty God. Say, who's our God? That's not the name. He's just saying, who's our God? Save the Lord. There's the name. There's the title. Remember, Almighty God? God Almighty was my name, God Almighty. Save the Lord. And who is a rock, save our God, capital G God. First Samuel 2, 2 says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee, neither is there any rock like our God. There's always false gods, lowercase g gods in the world. Satan's always trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ. And he's always a corrupt counterfeit. We're going to get into this. Okay. Okay. This should be enough to get anyone that is truly a Bible believer to want to study the matter and find the truth like this sister in Christ here is doing. Okay, one is in the Bible, the other one isn't. One's a title for God that God chose. One's a title for God's, plural, that mankind chose. Okay, we're going to get into this. The Godhead. This is going to be a while, so please, I pray you have time and you have patience, you know. Bible says in meekness, before it says in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, it talks about you need to be, uh, you need to be gentle unto all men. Uh, patient. Apt to teach. We're going through the Bible. I'm trying to teach you the truth. I'm not here to attack you. I'm here to teach you the truth for Bible believers. Okay. The Godhead. What is the Godhead in the Bible? And we're going to go through and show the scriptures on it. The Godhead in the Bible is God the Father in the person, singular, of Jesus Christ. Body, soul, and spirit. God the Father is the soul. We're going to prove this. 
Jesus is the body. We're going to prove this. He's the image. He's the flesh of God. He's the body of God. He's the image of God. He's the person of God. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God. And you have body, soul, and spirit. But that soul is the one true God. And because the body and soul are connected, they are together, they're one, Jesus is also God. The, he's God the Father, manifest in the flesh. He can take on the titles of God. And we're going to get into this, and we're going to prove this. What does Satan do? He always does a counterfeit. He sees three things there, body, soul, and spirit. And he has to counterfeit it. But remember, when Satan counterfeits... He corrupts it greatly. So then we got, that's the true Godhead. God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. It's so simple to explain what the Godhead is. God the Father in the person, singular, of Jesus Christ. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We're going to get into that. He has God the Father in Him. He has the Holy Spirit in Him. He's the body. That's the Godhead. Jesus is the Godhead. That's what the Bible teaches. Satan comes along and he counterfeits it. He sees three things and he counterfeits it. So what is the Trinity? I can't show you in the scriptures what Trinity is because Trinity is not in the Bible in any way, shape, or form. So you have to go to who created the, the term Trinity, the title Trinity. It's not a term, it's a title. Who created that title? Well, it came from philosophy and it was created by the Catholic Church. Okay, there's, I have some teachings and there's other brethren out there that have amazing teachings on this. Okay? But the true Trinity teaching is God in three persons. God the Father, God, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Four gods. See how Satan always seems to corrupt everything? Just corrupts it completely. It went from being one God to now there's four gods. It, this is it's four gods. And they try to use philosophy. Well, it's three, look, it's three gods that make up one God. So it's still one God. No, it's four gods. How do we know that? Because they teach that God the Father is not God the Son. And God the Son is not God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. That's three separate gods. And they say it makes up, but they're all one God. They're all the God. Okay. And here's the thing about the Catholic Church. When they created the Trinity, you look at their pictures and images of the Trinity, they show an old man as God the Father. And the old man has a body, soul, and spirit of his own. Body, soul, and spirit of his own. And then you have a young man that's oftentimes a Gentile with long hippie hair, Okay, blue-eyed Gentiles, and it's not even a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He is a Jew. Okay? God the Father manifests in the flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in the Virgin Mary. He was a Jew. And he's depicted as having a body, soul, and spirit separate from God the Father. And then you have the Holy Spirit being depicted as a dove. And there's a problem with this because animals have a... Uh, have a body, and they have a spirit, they don't have a soul. And this has been proven in other studies. I'm not going to get into it here. But they have a dove there, and they're claiming that dove is a person that has a body, soul, and spirit of his own. You have to really go outside the Bible to preach this. Now, the problem I see more than anything among the body of Christ, I'm talking about believers, the, the fighting is they're saying, that's not what the Trinity means, that's not... You don't get to define what the Trinity means. You don't get to try to say the Trinity and the Godhead are the same. Whoever came up with the word Trinity get put it out and said this is what it means. They get to define it. It's called the law of first mention. There's times where people can take something from the Bible and pervert it. Absolutely. Someone can take Godhead from the Bible and say, well, Godhead just means that Jesus has the qualities of God. They can pervert what God said. But when someone takes something that's not even in the scriptures, you don't get to turn around and say, well, we're going to try to make the Trinity like the Godhead, and we're going to make the Trinity line up more with the Godhead. You don't get to do that. You can try, but you'll be found a liar every time. Add thou not to his word, lest you approve thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay. You have to go outside the Bible to preach and teach this. And the Catholic Church don't believe in final authority as far as the Bible. They are the final authority. 
Man is the final authority. God isn't the final authority through his perfect written word. That's how philosophy comes in, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, vain deceit. Colossians 2.8, Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That's where I've been getting it, Colossians 2.8. Spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now here's the thing, brothers and Christ, I've come, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I've come across brethren who believe the Godhead of the King James Bible. They don't believe that for one second. They don't believe that, you know, God in three persons. They don't, but they say it. They don't believe, you know, God the Father has a body, soul, and spirit of his own. They don't believe the Son of God. It's supposed to be the Son of God. Chap that's chapter and verse. That's absolute truth. It's capital S, Son of God, not God the Son. You, you make Jesus a lowercase g God because there's only one capital G God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us, those who are truly saved and born again, Bible believers, but to us, there's only one capital G God, the Father. There is no God the Son in the Bible. I'm getting ahead of myself again. And God the Holy Spirit, it's not there. But they don't believe that. They don't believe that Jesus has a body, soul, and spirit apart from the Father. And they don't believe the Holy Spirit has a body, soul, and spirit apart from Jesus Christ and apart from... They don't believe what the true Trinity is. But they can't seem to let go of the Trinity terms that aren't found in the Bible. They can't seem to let go. They think they're defending the Word of God when they're tearing the Word of God and they're going against the Word of God. They're attacking the Word of God. Every time they say Trinity, they're saying a better rendering would be, yea, hath God said. Every time they say God three persons, they're saying a better rendering would be, yea, hath God said. They're attacking the true Godhead of the King James Bible. But when you set them down and you have patience and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, they don't believe the Trinity for one second. Some do. That's what the Trinity is. And they can't handle it. They're like, oh, that's not it. Yeah, it is. Why would you have anything to do with it? I used to say it. I know other brethren out there that used to say it. But we're coming to the realization that we were indoctrinated by the yea God said. We didn't believe the Trinity for one second. I don't believe Peter Ruckman believes the Trinity for one second. Brian Denlinger, he'd come out, he used to believe in the Trinity. And, uh, he, didn't believe, he believed the Godhead and he used the Trinity terms. He doesn't believe the Trinity for one second. 33rd book. You sit down and you probably talk with uh, David Daniels, Sam Gipp. They don't believe the Trinity for one second. But they won't give up the words. Brian's given them up. 33rd book's given them up. I've given them up. Okay. But you have some of them that still hold on to traditions of men. Philosophy. Oh, and they can use excuses. Oh, there's lots of words that we use that are in the Bible. That's the pagan trinity. Now you notice the difference. Godhead, God the Father, and the person, the one true God, God the Father, in the person, Jesus Christ. Which makes Jesus God. Versus God in three persons, which each person has a body, soul, and spirit. You say, where are you getting this on? Before we even get into the scriptures more on what the Godhead is, here's one thing that all you need to do to, to disprove the Trinity. To show that the Trinity is not the true teaching. What is a person? You ever hate these people out? Well, a person is just, we feel a person is just, could be, and they come out with their own feelings and opinions and whatnot. All right. What is a person? And that's where these books come in. <laughs> in the old days, you have the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So if you had problems with words, you could always look up some words. I, bought, I got it electronically here. It'll save us a lot of time. I could have had it marked, and we could have still gone through the book. Then, once you get definitions, remember, this isn't the final authority. I'm going to show you why. This is not the final authority. Then, you, this is a concordance. I've got an electronic concordance where you start going through the word person in the Bible and find out, does it line up? You still have to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, you still have to study. But when you ask these people, what does the word person mean? What's the definition of person? A lot of them are clueless. I was. Before I started doing the work, I was. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay. Definition number one. An individual human being. I don't believe that. I don't like the word human. Hugh, man, Hugh is a false god. Man can be gods. The word human is not a proper word to use. Creature. And we're going to get into this. Why am I saying creature? I'll explain why. It should say an individual creature 
being consisting, uh, being creature consisting, not it says human being, it shouldn't say that, it should be creature consisting of body and soul. We apply the word to living beings only. There's your spirit. Don't you remember the Old Testament? They yield up the ghost. They, they gave up the spirit. The spirit would leave a body when it dies. So it's no longer a person because you have to have all three to be a person. You have to be a body, you have to have a soul, and a living beings. Possessed of a rational nature. The body when dead is not called a person. And it's applied to a man, woman, or child. Not animals. An animal is not a person. It doesn't have a body, soul, and spirit. A definition of two says a man, a woman, or child considering, considered as opposed to things. In other words, this mug isn't a person. It's got, uh, it's got a body. It's, got, it's, a tech, it's physical. It's got a body. But it doesn't have a spirit. And it doesn't have a soul. It's not a person. This table isn't a person. Okay, this book. I don't say this book. This book isn't a person. <laughs> you know, the hat. Sorry, Declan. You're not a person. You're, you got a body, and he's got a spirit. Okay, remember the spirit of man. There's a spirit of animals. That's a whole other teaching. But the definition is you have to have a body, soul, and spirit. That's where I get it from. People say you're just making stuff up. No, I'm not. I've researched. I've studied. Now, I read this and say, okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. However, we go to cert. I did a word study on the word person. We do a word study on the word person. The first time person is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 39, 6. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. This is when Joseph was under the captain of the guard, of Pharaoh's guard. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. A goodly person, body, soul, and spirit. That person is a reference to Joseph. What is Joseph? He's alive, he has a body, and he has a soul. You, know, you don't have to turn here. We're going to go through just uh, several of them just to make the point. Exodus 20, 12, 48. Exodus 12, 48 says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. What's this person referring to? The stranger, the man that's not a Jew, a Gentile. A man or more, a man not that has a, a body, a soul, and a spirit. And we can keep going. Let's do one more. Le Leviticus 19.15 Ye shall do no unrighteousness in, in, in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. What is person being a reference, reference to? The first time it's to people that are poor. People, man, women, children that are poor, body, soul, and spirit. Second time, it's a reference to those that are mighty, strong, maybe wealthy. But, you know, man, woman, or child. Body, soul, and spirit. But the righteous shall judge, shall thou judge thy neighbor. The people around you that are alive, they have a body, soul, and spirit. And it goes on and on and on, and you can do a full study. Not once is a person referenced to something that doesn't have a body, soul, or spirit. Now, there's times where you can talk about someone who's dead, present tense, and you can be talking to about them like you're going back and telling a story when they were alive. So when you use the word person, it's in context of when they were alive. It's still body, soul, and spirit. But you don't refer, you're not supposed to. Like I said, today, people don't follow proper English. They don't follow, they make it today. It's a big push to make up your own definitions. We make up our own definitions for Trinity. We make up our own definitions for Godhead. We make up our own definition for Rapture. I'm going off on this for a second. For Rapture, okay? You look up the definition of Rapture. No, no, Rapture just means caught up. That's, that's all Rapture means. Rapture just means caught up. Rapture is philosophy. And you know what Rapture means? A seizing by violence. Transport, ecstasy, violence of a pleasing passion, extreme joy or, or, or pleasure. Rapid with violence, a hurrying along with velocity as rolling and torrent rapture. 
enthusiasm, uncommon heat of imagination. You know the word caught up is not in that definition at all? It, people have been lied to and saying, well, rapture just means caught We just changed the definition of everything. We don't actually study the issue. We don't even actually, words have meaning. God chose words for a reason. He chose Godhead. He chose person, and person has a definition, body, soul, and spirit. Now here I said basically, remember what I said, they should have said creature? It, when it said an individual human being, no, it should have been an individual creature. Now today, most of the time, in, in the schooling and, and secular world, they try to make it out where creature just means animals, animals, animals. No, it doesn't. That's not the Bible definition of the word creature. So basically you have a creature, that and creature, when you look up the word creature, in the Webster's 1820, it says that which is created. That's all creature means, that which is created. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You've been made new. The old man is dead and buried. The new man is alive with Christ, living in Christ, the changed life. But creature means that which is created. It can mean anything. If you actually look at the definition, this was created. It doesn't even necessarily mean it has to be something living, you know. It could be a rock, it could be a stone, it could be the earth, it could be the sky. You look up the definition, okay. That which is created. And yes, animals are created by God. Okay? That which is created that has a body and a soul and a spirit. Mankind. That's what person means. But is this backed by the scriptures? Yes, we went through some of the scriptures. It would take forever because the word person is used a lot throughout the Bible. In other words, you're without excuse for those who try to believe, well, person can mean something, can mean just the spirit. No, it can't. Well, person can mean just the body by itself. No, it can't. Person can just mean the, the, the soul by itself. No, it can't. It requires all three together to be called a person. God the Father by himself is not called a person. The Holy Spirit by himself is not called a person. Jesus, we're going to get into this, he's called a person. Uh, we did a little bit of the, the sword searcher, the word person. So we're into this. How many times is Jesus, the Son of God, called a person in the Bible? How many times? Four. Let's go over those four. Job 13.8. Job 13.8. This is all you need to really debunk the Trinity if you love the truth. And words have meaning, and it's all about what the Bible actually says. The Bible actually calls Jesus a person. You know, they say God in three persons. Uh, where is God the Father called a person? I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus called a person four times. Job 13.8. Job 13.8. Will ye accept his person? Will ye contend for God? And people don't understand when it says his person, what's it talking about? It's talking about in the Old Testament, it was angel of the Lord and angel of the Lord, that man, captain of the host of heaven. It was Jesus in the Old Testament. It was the body of God in the Old Testament. God had a body in the Old Testament that, had the, that, that was the person of God in the Old Testament. It was Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one capital G God. There's no God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. No, there's just God the Father, 1 Corinthians 8.6. For there is one capital G God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So in Job 13, 8 says, will you accept his person? It's talking about Jesus Christ. The person of God. This is just, remember, the Bible says, for uh, great is the mystery of godliness. The Godhead was not revealed until Paul, until the time of the Gentiles. So they didn't quite understand it. We can look back, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and we can say, okay, we know what this means because we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's the first time Jesus is called a person. It's talking about the person of God, which is Jesus. Matthew, how do we know this? Get to Matthew 27.24. Matthew 27.24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, because he kept telling him, I find no fault with this man. When Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate to be crucified, I find no fault with this man. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult, tumult was made, 
He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. He's called a person. This is the second time he's called a person. I always say this twice in the Old Testament, twice in the New. This is still Old Testament until Jesus actually dies on the cross. You learn about this in another study. You learn about this in the book of Hebrews. At the death of the testator does the New Testament come in. The New Testament doesn't actually come in until Jesus dies at the end of all four of the Gospels. Before Jesus dies, you're still in the Old Testament. Even though it's a collection of books called the New Testament. Okay? But this is still in the Old Testament and he's called a person. That's the second time that Jesus is called a person. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.10. Here's the third time. 2 Corinthians 2.10. This one you can't argue. It has the word Christ and person in the same, same verse. To whom ye forgave anything, I forgave also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person, singular, of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Person of Jesus Christ. There's the third time he's called a person. This is actually in the New Testament now. It's after his death, burial, and resurrection. All right. Hebrews 1, this is the big controversial one. We're going to get into it a little bit more. But Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. There's his person. Remember up there in Job 13.8 it says, Will ye accept his person? That's how we're able to link him. Okay, that's talking about Jesus Christ. Here in Hebrews, it's talking about Jesus Christ. They'll try, and we're going to go through it a little bit. Sorry for how long, we're going to go through a long video. I love the Word of God. I pray you do too, and you stay with us. But it's important to study the Word of God. I mean, express the image of His person. We're going to get into that and prove that this person here is talking about Jesus Christ. It's so easy, the brightness of His glory. And upholding all things by the Word of His power... When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's talking about Jesus Christ. The whole thing's talking about Jesus Christ, who Jesus is to God the Father. He's a per his person. Okay. Now, how many times is God the Father called a person? They argue about Hebrews. No. I'm not going give to give him an inch. It's talking about Jesus, and it's easy to prove, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. But how many times is God the Father called a person? Zero. They'll try to argue, well, Hebrews is talking about God the Father. Here's the second question. How many times is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, there is no God the Spirit, it's ho the Holy Spirit of God. God is a Spirit, the Spirit of God. But there is no God the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. How many times is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, called a person in the Scriptures? Zero. And they don't, the Trinitarians, they don't contend this. So then why do you say God in three persons? Here's why. They'll say, yes, but he or she or him or her, etc. can be a person. Man, woman, child, they can be a person, you know. But it's not exact. I was going to use another word, but I want to make sure I'm using the words properly. It's not, I was going to say it's not definitive. Definitive means it's absolute. And I'll show you why. In other words, the word here is not always a reference to a person. He is not always a reference to a person. She is not always a reference to a person. Him is not always a reference to a person. Okay, and so on and so on. A good example of this is Proverbs 120. Proverbs 120. They'll try to make it out like, well, if it just says he, or if it says him, or something like that, it's got to be, it's a person. It's not definitive. It's not exact. Proverbs 1.20 says, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. So, wisdom is a person. It's got a body, soul, and spirit, right? No. Wisdom is an attribute. It's a trait. And it's referred to as a she. Proverbs 8.1 says, Doth not wisdom cry? And understand, understanding put forth her voice? So now understanding is re referred to as a her, and wisdom is still being referred to as a her. This isn't a person. They don't like that. Proverbs 9.1, Proverbs 9.1, Wisdom hath builded her house, 
She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Her and her and she is a reference to wisdom. And that's just one trait. There's a lot of other traits that uses the word her. Okay? These words can mean a person. It can. Or it can mean something like animals. Or a trait, like we just read there about traits. Okay? Numbers 22-25 says, Numbers 22-25, And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall, and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. This is a donkey. A donkey's not a person. So when they say, well, what about here? No, it has to say person to be definitive. Where in the Bible is God the Father called a person? He's not. Where in the Bible is the Holy Spirit of God called a person? It isn't. So then why would you say God in three persons? Because you're not a Bible believer. Or you've been indoctrinated, like some brethren like me one time. We say it because, hey, everyone, we've always said it. This is the way we've always been taught to say it. But when you actually do a solid study on this book, you'll stop saying God in three persons as it applies to this book. Notice I'm saying it. I say lots of words that are in the Bible, but I will not say thus saith the Lord. The Godhead is God the Father and the person singular of Jesus Christ. That's thus saith the Lord. Okay? It has to say person. And God saw fit to call our Lord and Savior a person four times in the Bible. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. It says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness... We're going to break all three down. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him. Jesus is the body. God the Father is the soul. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit. And they all dwell within Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the person of the Godhead. He is the Godhead. John 10... Pause the video uh, and or turn to John chapter 10 and read 22 through 39. 22 through 39. Okay? I'm going to grab the verse 38 because I'm not trying to grab it out of context. I'm just trying to save time. But John 10, 38 says, But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the work that ye may know, and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The Father is in me? John 14, 10 we read, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? I don't have God the Father the soul in me. I have the Spirit of God in me. Okay? But because I have the Spirit of God in me, they talk about God in you. Or talk about Jesus, the hidden man of the heart. You have Jesus in you. No, I don't have the physical body of Jesus in me. I don't have the, the soul of God the Father in me. I have the Holy Spirit in me. And because all three, body and soul and spirit, are connected, they can all claim to be in me. But it's the Holy Spirit we have in us. It's the Holy Spirit that we receive. But he says the Father is in me. I don't have God the Father in me. Only Jesus did. He's God Almighty fully and completely. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. When Jesus spoke, it was God the Father speaking. When Jesus healed, it was God the Father healing. When Jesus did miracles, it was God the Father doing miracles. He doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And every time Jesus would say, I'm the Son of God, they would go to stone him. Or if he said that God was his Father, they'd go to stone him. Why? Because you're making yourself equal to God. He's God the Father. He's saying, I'm God the Father manifest in the flesh. I'm God in the flesh. I'm God Almighty. There's only one God. Okay, yeah. When Jesus spoke, it was God the Father speaking through him. When Jesus did the works, miracles, uh, healing, it was God the Father doing it. Matthew 3.16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God. He saw. Who saw? We already talked about that. Esau. I have a whole study. Esau, not Esau. He saw, not Esau. Because it just rhymed has nothing to do with Esau, but it rhymed. But the he saw there was John the Baptist. This was a sign for John the Baptist. No one else saw it. Just John the Baptist saw it. Someone tried to correct me. People are just got that spirit of correction. They just always got to correct say, well, Jesus saw it. Jesus is God and God sees everything. 
We're talking about people down here. Because they always try to preach and teach that everybody saw this that was down there. Nobody saw it except John the Baptist. It was a sign for him to let him know this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is God manifest in the flesh. But it says, He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And lighted, descended like a dove. He's not a dove. The Spirit is not a dove. It was a cloud surrounding the glory of the Lord, surrounding the Holy Spirit, because you can't see a spirit. So God had to surround it with His glory. And this is a whole other study we did, the glory of the Lord. How does the glory of the Lord present itself? Fire, smoke, and cloud, and light. Those are the three things, a whole other study. But the glory of the Lord was surrounding the Holy Spirit as it came down, So, and only John, who had the Holy Spirit in him, because you read about that, he had a Holy Spirit in him on his birth. Okay, it, the Holy Spirit came into Elizabeth while she was uh, with child. He could see this dove come down, uh, the Holy Spirit come down like as a dove, and lighten upon him. And we talked about this, all these old, I don't want to get into this study too much, but in the Old Testament, you have Elijah, I think it is. Elijah, Elisha. I get him confused sometimes, forgive me. But one of the two, he's sitting there, he's telling his servant to go up seven times because he's saying that after the seven years of, of no rain, now rain's going to come. And he sets the servant up seven times, and by the seventh time he says, I see a little cloud, and it looks like a hand. But it's a cloud, it's not a hand. It, like a dove, it's not a dove, it's a cloud, I believe. But you still see the Holy Spirit coming in, showing John that, hey, this is, this is the Godhead. This is the person of God. God the Father's in him, the Holy Spirit's in him, and he's the body. Jesus Christ is the body, the Son of God. Son of God, shown connection. And lo, a little voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God the Father is in him, and the Spirit of God is in him. In him, Jesus Christ dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That is the Godhead. Jesus is the Godhead. The pagan trinity teaches that, no, they're not one and the same. God the Father is not God the Son. God the, the, God, the body is connected to the soul. They're one. Now, I don't want to go into it too much. I was talking to a brother in Christ about this. When we're born, we're born with our body and soul connected. They are one. When my body sins, it taints my soul. It's as if my soul is sinning. Because my, when my body sins, my soul is tainted with that sin. Because my body and my soul are connected. They are one. What does Jesus do when we get saved? That spiritual circumcision made without hands. And he severs that connection from our soul and our body. And my soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. He is my body. And now when my body sins today, it no longer taints my soul because they're not one. They're still in the same vessel, if you want to say it. My body and soul are still together in one place. But my soul is not connected to my body. Jesus is God the Father. He was born with the whole, I believe, born with the Holy Spirit and God the Father in him. And the body, all three are connected. They're all one. They are one from day one. And Jesus never sinned. Remember it says he became sin who knew no sin. He, the body never sinned, tainting the soul. He was perfect. Completely perfect. They are one. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the inter his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. What's the Godhead? God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus has a body, the flesh, that you can see. You can only see a body. You can't see a soul. You can't see a spirit. I might have missed that verse or I'm getting ahead of myself. But Jesus said, uh, a, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Okay? A soul, you can't see a soul. You can't see a spirit. Jesus is the image of God. The body is the image. Okay? Body, soul, and spirit. Guess what? He's, he likens it to things that are made. What else has a body, soul, and spirit? Well, we just did a study, a, a, a quick, like barely word study on, on person. So who's created down here that has a body, soul, and spirit? Mankind. Genesis 1.20. Genesis 1.20. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, him, Adam. 
Male and female created he them. The reason I'm saying this is because people... I, I lost some fellowship with brethren, and I wish I didn't, but the truth is the truth. Let us make man in our image. It's talking about Adam. After our likeness, that's Adam and Eve. Remember, image is something you can physically see. It's just talking about the body. It's not talking about the spirit. It's not talking about the soul. It's just talking about the body. Man was made in the image of God. Men and women were made in the likeness of God. How do we know this? You do a word study in the word image, just like we did. You can do it the old way, or you can do it the, the, the long way, or the quick way. But you do a study in the word image, it's always something you, it's physical that you can see. Even if you're trying to imagine an image in your head, you're imagining something physical that you can see. Okay? The body, in this case, for this subject, for the image, is the body. Luke 24, 39. A lot of people don't like using this. Luke 24, 39 says, Behold my hands, here it is, Behold my hands and my feet, that is, I myself, handle me. This is when Jesus appears to the disciples, and he's saying, It is I, you know. Handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. You can only see a body. You can't see a spirit, and you can't see a soul. The image there, when we're talking about in Genesis 1.26, is a little bit of a tangent, so bear with me. It's just something that fr frustrates me that I've lost fellowship with brethren because I'm trying to stand for the Word of God, and they're holding on to traditions of men, rudiments of the world. We've always said this, men and women are made in the image of God. No, they're not. Only man was made in the image of God. Okay? God is a man. There's one meter between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is God, the Father manifests the flesh. God is a man. And people can't handle that. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 we read, 1 Corinthians 11, 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he, it's talking about the man, not a woman, for he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. All right? Now, what we're, now that that's out of the way, it's not the image, it's the likeness that we're going for here. Man, most it says there at the top, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then at the bottom it says, so God created man in his own image. And the image of God created he, him. It's not talking about mankind. It's talking about Adam. Then it says, male and female, male and female created he them after our likeness. That's that part where he talks about creating male and female after, after our likeness. What's the likeness? Well, what's the Godhead? And we just read up there, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Mankind. Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. We have a body, soul, and spirit. Okay, We're made after his likeness. Both men and women are made in the likeness of God. We all have a basic body, a soul, and a spirit. Now our body's different, <laughs> different a little bit, uh, but we have the same body. We have hearts, we have lungs, you know, skin, hair. But we differ, because God wants a distinction between the body of a man and a woman, but we both have a spirit, the same spirit. We both have the same soul, same type of soul. We're made in his likeness, body, soul, and spirit. You cannot see a soul or spirit. This is why the Bible calls Jesus the image of God. We see it time and time again. Jesus is the image of God. Let's see if we can find one right here. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And whom the lowercase g God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, talking about Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He's the body of God. When it says image, it's talking about he's the flesh of God. Feed the church of God with he purchased with his own blood. He's the body of God. He's the, God's body. Okay, he's the image of God. God is a man. One meter between men. Okay. Man and God, the man Christ Jesus. God is a man. He's not a woman in any way, shape, or form. They always try to say the equally masculine and feminine voice of the God who loves us. That's paganism. That's Satanism. God is a man. And that man is Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness hath delivered us from the power of darkness 
and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the son of God. God meant the only begotten son, born of, derived from. He's the flesh of God. And whom we have redemption through his blood, I'm talking about Jesus, even the forgiveness of sin, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. When Jesus was raised from the bed, dead, someday we're going to get our good new bodies and be glorified just like Jesus was. He's the firstborn. Okay. That being said, he's the image of the visible God. And once again, notice it says through his blood, and yet Jesus, there's a verse that says, God says, uh, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So there's Jesus' blood, the body's blood, but that body's blood is God the Father's blood also. It's the body of God. That's the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. And they're one in Christ Jesus. In Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But we are created in the same likeness. So when you look at us, we have a body, soul, and spirit. God has a body, soul. God the Father is the soul, and He has a body and spirit of His own. He's a person. That person is Jesus Christ. It's not hard to understand. It's, it's hard for people to swallow. It's hard for people to believe and just simply have faith. Okay? Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Now we're going to get to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God, who has son three times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto, his, uh, spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had laid, had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Real quick, I want to come back to this one real quick to talk about who the person is there. Okay, I forgot, in my notes I forgot, even though we mentioned we'd do it, I forgot to put it in the notes in the right order, so please forgive me. So we're going back to this verse for a second just to prove that this is talking about Jesus. Okay, It says up there in verse 2, Hath in the last day spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Heir of all things? His Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Matthew, 21, Matthew chapter 21, 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said unto themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Now he says, this is a parable that's being spoken. If you want to pause and read the whole parable that's being spoken, he's talking about himself. God sent a lot of prophets, and they either stoned the prophets, threw the prophets out, and killed them. And then God sent his son, capital S, son of God, God manifest in the flesh, his only begotten son. He's the heir. Still talking about Jesus Christ, not the Father. Matthew 8.20, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The term Son, capital S, Son of Man, refers to Jesus being the heir. He's of the, he's of the, he's of the lineage of King David. He's heir to the throne. Son of God, he's heir to everything else. Okay. All through the gospel, Son of Man is Jesus, who is the heir of King David, and the heir of all things, when it's the Son of God. Okay. It also says in that in Hebrews 1 through uh, 3, it says, He made the worlds. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the capital W Word. And the capital W Word was with God, and the capital W Word was God. Body and soul connected. They are one. The same was in the beginning with God. God the Father, the soul, had a body in the beginning. He had a spirit in the beginning. All three were there in the beginning. The person of the Godhead was there at the very beginning. So what it says, the same was with, was in the beginning with God. It's saying the body of God, and God the Father is the soul. The body was there with the soul. They were both there. They're one. Verse 3, all things were made by Him. Talking about the capital W word. The body, Jesus Christ. The person of God, the Godhead, all three are there. If you read the scriptures, they all claim credit for creating things. The Holy Spirit does, God the Father does. But the person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, was there and He created everything. God the Father was in Him, the Holy Spirit's there in Him. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made 
made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What do we see up there? Who be in the brightness of his glory? Who says he made the worlds? Who be in the brightness of his glory? It's referring to who Jesus Christ is to God the Father. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness compre comprehended it not. Colossians 1.15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, where they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What are we reading up here in Hebrews 1.2? He made the worlds. Who, who's it talking about? Jesus Christ. Who being the brightness of his glory, John 8.12 says, John 8.12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have, shall have the light of life. John 9.5 says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Today, Jesus is in us, and Jesus shines through us, through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is supposed to shine through us. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But Jesus, when he's physically present, he's the light of the world. John 3, 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, the real Godhead of the King James Bible, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. Okay. Person in Hebrews 1.3 is referenced to who Jesus is to God. Who being the brightness of his glory, it's talking about Jesus Christ, that's the who is Jesus Christ. His is God the Father's glory. God the Father's glory is Jesus. He's the brightness of, of, of his glory. The who is Jesus Christ. And the expressed image of his person, the expressed image, who's the image of God? Jesus Christ. Of his person, his being God the Father, person shows ownership, who, who Jesus is to God the Father. Person there still reference to Jesus Christ. Don't let them deceive you of trying to push the pagan trinity. You know, trinity is not in the Bible. God three persons, it's not in the Bible. It's actually, these things go against the word of God. Okay. Acts 17.29. Acts, the list last one, Acts 17.29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, remember we talked about the Godhead, how likened to creation, we are made in the likeness of, God, of the Godhead, of God, body, soul, and spirit. We ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. And we just talked about this. What can you see of the Godhead? You can't see the soul. You can't see the spirit. What can we see? The body. Jesus is the image of the Godhead. So when it's talking about thinking the Godhead is likened to gold or silver, this is talking about we're not allowed to make images of Jesus Christ. And people don't seem to like that. You're not to make an image of Jesus Christ. You're in sin if you make images of Jesus Christ. And I believe there's a reason for it. There's so many counterfeits out there today. Antichrist. We just talked about it. The pagan trinity shows a man that's not even Jew, not even Jewish, it's a false Christ. It's a false image. It's paganism. We're not supposed to have images of Jesus Christ. That's what it means there when it says the Godhead. Jesus is the image of the Godhead. He's the person of the Godhead. He is the Godhead, but he's the image. You can only see the body. We're not supposed to have pictures of Jesus Christ, and I don't. I don't have pictures of Jesus Christ in my house. I, don't have, I get rid of books that, have, that I couldn't salvage, King James Bibles that tried to put images of Jesus Christ in there. Even images of God the Father in there. Because a lot of the old, some of the old King James Bibles that had pictures in them, they had pictures of God the Father as an old man. The pagan trinity. Okay. We're not supposed to have images of the Godhead. You can't have an image of God the Father because nobody knows what the soul looks like. You can't, but they try to make God the Father out to be an old man. That's still a sin to have an image of God the Father in any way, shape, or form. It's a sin to have an image of the body, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in any way, shape, or form. It's a sin when they try to make the Spirit out to be a dove and show a dove as an as a image or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's sin. It's wickedness. 
were commanded not to do it. You're commanded not to do it. And those are the three times that God had as mentioned in the Bible. That's, for the Sister Christ, I'm sorry it's been a long video. I've still got a few more that I want to talk about, but that's the Godhead of the King James Bible. That's absolute truth. Like I said, the pagan trinity, I couldn't grab from the Bible because it's not there. I can only tell you this is what the, the trinity is, this is what they say it is, the Catholic Church. But we just found out that the Godhead is not like the trinity at all. The Godhead teaches that Jesus is God the Father. I and my Father are one. Uh, Peter, uh, Philip. Philip asked Jesus, says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Have I been a long time with thee, and hast thou not known me, Philip? Oh, not Peter, Philip. Looks at Philip and says, Have I been with thee so long time, hast thou not known me, Philip? Philip asked him to show us the Father, and Jesus saying, I've been with you this whole time. I am the Father. He that has seen me hath seen the Father. You can only see the body. The body is connected to the soul. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You have to go through the body to get to the soul. You have to go through the Son of God to get to God the Father and get forgiveness. To get saved, you have to go through the cross. And I can take that back to the Gospel. Now, John 8, 22. John 8, 22. John chapter 8, verse 22. Why is it such a long study? Because I want to back it with Scripture. I want to back it with the truth. John 8. John 8, verse 22. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Go back to 19. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye either know me, nor my father. They didn't ask him about him. They asked him about the father. Neither have ye known me, nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. The word spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his, not, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am He. You shall die in your sins. When does this Godhead teaching become a salvation issue? When the Jesus Christ that you're trying to believe in isn't God the Father manifest on the flesh. If you don't believe that Jesus is God the Father manifest on the flesh, that it was God the Father's blood that was shed on the cross, you're putting your faith in an antichrist, a false Christ. You're still on your way to hell, and you're going to die in your sins. It's just that simple. When does this become a salvation issue? Like I said, there are brethren that believe the Godhead of the King James Bible, and they can't seem to let go of the terms of Trinity and God and three per They can't seem to let go of it. But when you break it down like I have with the Scriptures, or I'm sorry, the Trinity, what the true Trinity is, because you can't find it in the Scriptures, it's... It's paganism, it's worldliness, it's traditions of men, it's philosophy. When you break down the, the Catholic Church, what they say the true Trinity is, they'll sit there and go, I don't believe that. Well, praise God that they don't believe it. Their problem is, is they have a hard time sticking with this book and with the, what the Bible actually says. But when you have people that are the hardcore, you know, Jesus isn't God the Father manifest in the flesh. We had a video on this. Jesus is not Almighty God. Those people are lost and on their way to hell. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Catholics, all the daughters of the whore, all these false Christs of all these organized religion, Babel building system. And they're pushing the Trinity and they're pushing a false Christ. They're... Our job, what's our job to do? To preach the truth, to be a light. Remember, Jesus is, went to heaven, he's got caught up to heaven, and he's preparing a place for us. Now we're supposed to be the light. And we're supposed, Jesus is supposed to shine through us, and we're supposed to preach the truth to those who want the truth. There's people who couldn't make it this far in this video that probably reject the Godhead of the King James Bible, and they love their pagan trinity. But we're supposed to keep trying. We're supposed to keep trying to preach the truth. Okay? 
Jesus made himself God and equal to God a lot, and the people rejected it. The question is, will you? Do you believe Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh, that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross? That when Jesus spoke, it was God the Father speaking. When Jesus healed, it was God the Father healing through him. That Jesus and, and God the Father, the body and soul, are one. Do you believe in the real Jesus Christ, who is God fully and completely? Singular, God fully and completely. The Son of God. It's very important. Okay, If you don't believe in the real Jesus Christ, you'll never get truly saved and born again. I believe, when I came to Cop Broken, I said, God, you sacrificed your Son. And that it was your blood that was shed on the cross, and only God's blood can wash my sins away. And a lot of people, like I said, a lot of brethren, they believe the Godhead. They believe Jesus is God. That it was his, that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross. They just have a hard time letting go of that indoctrination of yea hath God said. Philosophy, they're spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Titus 2.15 Titus 2.15 Brothers says Christ, we're supposed to keep trying to preach the truth to him no matter what. Titus 2.15 and 16. Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving. Remember we said when we started this about faith? Without faith it's impossible to please him. You have to believe this book. That it is God's perfect written word. But them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. But this is Christ. You're going to be dealing with people that no matter how much I try to show them, hey, you're adding to God's word. You're subtracting from God's word. Their mind and conscience is defiled because they don't truly believe in this book. This system Christ, like, I believe in this book, and I just don't know what the big deal is. I, I don't understand. One word's in here. One title for God is in here. The other title isn't, but they're pushing that other title. This is the truth. But to those that are have minds, uh, that even their minds and conscience are defiled, remember, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit, is nothing pure. The Word of God isn't pure. It's got mistakes. It's got errors. We can improve on the Word of God. We can add to it and subtract from it as we see fit. And these people, I mean, I, I'll go back to the Gospel. When they keep pushing faith alone, faith alone, faith, it's like chapter and verse where it actually says faith alone. And you know what? They don't care. They don't care what the Bible actually says. And they're so defiled, so spoiled, so rotten, that it's like nothing I say is going to reach them because we don't have the same authority. But you cover once in a while, you come across someone who does have the, that is, unto the pure all things are pure. They do have a love of God's word. And they say, wait a second, that's not in here. I want what's in here. I don't want what the world has to say. I want what's actually in here. Verse 16 says, they profess that they know God. In the context of what we're talking about here, the pagan trinity. They profess that they know gods. I mean, God. Gods that make up God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Why is it reprobate? If you don't believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If you don't believe in the real Jesus Christ, you're going to die in your sins. Everything you do is reprobate. You're still going to have to answer for your sins to Jesus Christ someday. God Almighty manifests in the flesh. Okay? Psalms 119, 140 says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Unto the pure all things are pure. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Someone who's truly a Bible believer is going to take the word as it is. They're going to study it. They're going to do what we did, compare scripture with scripture. Uh, words have meaning. They're going to study words and everything. Okay. But we have to keep trying to preach the truth. There are brethren that believe the Godhead but refuse to let go of Colossians 2.8. They're spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They're indoctrinated by that yea hath God said disease. Yea hath God said. A better rendering would be we can improve on God's word. We can say it better than God. Our way of saying it is better than the way God said it. It's hard to drop. I had that a little bit. As praise God, I didn't have it a lot, but I've known men that had it a lot, 
And they were still, God was able to overcome that in their life, and they're getting back to saying things the Bible way. What the Bible actually says. So, brothers, sisters in Christ, I want to end this with this. Uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech of wisdom, wisdom of the world, declaring unto you the testimony of God, God's wisdom. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When I first got saved, I believed Jesus is God, and it was God's blood that was shed on the cross. Did I understand the Godhead fully when I first got saved? No. But I believe Jesus is God, and there's only one God. One God, period. Say, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, philosophy, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. No, he's saying, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power, this book is a Holy Spirit discerned book. Truth is truth. And that's what Paul preached, the truth. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, the Trinity, but in the power of God, the Godhead. That's where our wisdom remains. By the Holy Spirit and God's wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberty and braideth not, and it shall be given to him. We want our wisdom from God, not philosophy. Not traditions of men, not rudiments of the world, not man's wisdom. I want God's wisdom. And that's what I want for you, brothers and Christ. If you've gone through this, there's a lot more you can study. I'm sorry it was so long because there's so much you can study on the Godhead to prove the Godhead of the King James Bible. There's so much I've left out. Not purposely, it's just we don't have that much time. I've made a lot of other videos. You can go to them. Other brethren have made a lot of good, solid videos on defending the Godhead of the King James Bible. But sister in Christ, if you're still with me, praise God, um, and anybody else is still with me, all around, the Godhead and the Trinity are not the same thing. Godhead, absolute truth. Trinity, paganism. False gods. Lies. Philosophy. Rudiments of the world. Man's wisdom. Godhead, God's wisdom. I pray that you come to the knowledge of the truth and you start standing for the Godhead and start defending the Godhead. That's fighting for God's Word. That's standing for God's Word. When you keep fighting for the train, those of you who believe the Godhead, but you keep using those other terms, you're attacking this book. You're not standing for this book. You're attacking it. Okay? Once again, the Godhead is God the Father in the person singular of Jesus Christ. That's the Godhead. That's what we need to fight for. That's what I believe. That's who saved me, Jesus Christ, who is God fully and completely. God saved me through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.